Watching the world burn, watching the world burn. January 19th, 2024. Let's get into it. First off, let's get the little guy on the video. There he is. He won't walk today. He just wants to ride in the basket, which is which is okay, but I gotta get him walking at some point. Cute little guy, isn't he? Let's get him get, get his little face right there. Yeah. Alright. Yeah, the ex the old battle axe, the ex-wife lets me have him from time to time. So I wanted to get into, well, all kinds of different things today. The first one was that uh, North Korea conducted a uh, underwater nuclear test. Now, I haven't gotten any news as to whether it was actually a nuclear explosion underwater uh, or it was just a test of the, the delivery mechanism. Now, the, the thing I wanted to talk about was the delivery mechanism because this is the scariest thing to me. I don't think that people have given this much thought. So before I get into my my thoughts on that, think about the nuclear triad, okay? You've got the bombers, the nuclear bombers. Now those, I consider them offensive weapons, okay? In, in other words, first strike capability. Because if the other, if the enemy launches, I doubt you're going to get those bombers off the ground before that that leg of the triad has blown out from underneath you. So if uh, you know North Korea launched on the United States and also an airburst. So let's say you do get the bombers off the ground. If there's a nuclear missile that's already on its way, uh, they just got to get near the a, a bomber in flight, or a, a, you know, I imagine it'd be three or four flying together. And, uh, and that air explosion would take those bombers right out of the air. So there you go. So I, I never considered the bombers a great portion of the nuclear fleet. Uh, same goes with the land-based silos. Okay, now I'm not talking about the mobile. See, in Russia, they did it right. They can maneuver their, their nuclear missiles around on uh, track vehicles all over the place. And they ride them because that's a huge country. And to track that with the satellites, sure, we probably know where most of them are, but you're not going to get all of them. And I'm not sure, I haven't seen any track-based uh, weapons. I'm sure we have them here in the United States, but uh, you don't see nuclear missiles rolling down the highway. At least I have never seen it, or maybe it's just covered up. You don't know. You think it's a pipe instead of it's a missile. Don't imagine that they advertise it. But anyway, the, the land-based, once again, in a first strike... I think that you would take out most of the land-based, the second leg of the nuclear triad. So now I'm getting to the point of the first part of this video. So now we got to think about what's the third leg. The third leg is our submarine fleet. And unfortunately, I think it was a stupid move. We built these huge submarines. You know, one submarine could probably nuke all of Russia. You know, well not all of Russia because it's huge, but I mean it would all the significant targets in Russia but the problem is you've got all your capability in one package so what happens if the enemy can track that submarine or if the enemy can strike that submarine in some fashion before it can launch or get into a position where it can launch on an enemy target what would happen there well because everything is advancing you know, you got the Hooties with missiles now, uh, taking on the, the fleet, the entire U.S. fleet in the Red Sea, for example. You know, so the world has completely changed. It's flipped upside down. So now we're getting back to that nuclear test. So supposedly this drone, it's an underwater drone. And see, I did a, a video a while back, maybe you can find it, where I talked about the advent of drones in warfare and I spent I don't know about a half hour talking about the advancements I won't go into that again you can go back and watch that video but I did not in that video cover underwater drones now I knew that we Ukraine has been using them against Russian ships somewhat ineffectively because the Russians have pretty much learned how to detect the drones and, and shoot them out of the water or, or we're just really not hearing about maybe some of the uh, explosions that have taken place. I think the Ukrainians have hit a couple of ships with those uh, those drones, but I always looked at it as okay, you know, uh, and some of those drones just kind of skirt along the top of the water. 
Well, this particular drone was like a submarine. It's a drone submarine. I didn't even know that North Korea has developed a drone submarine. And what that means is that now all they got to do is get near one of our nuclear subs underwater with a nuclear tipped drone and boom, that Trident submarine is toast and anything around it. So now we've got the third leg of the nuclear triad that is dead. So I guess the question is, how well can they track our, our nuclear submarines? Well, we're pretty good at knowing where the Russian submarines are. I imagine that the North Koreans in Russia are able to track our submarines pretty good. And with these underwater drones and a nuclear warhead, you're going to blow the shit out of the nuclear triad of the United States, the submarines. Just saying. All right. So that's the first part of this video. We're going to kind of bounce around today because I got some other things on my mind. But I'm going to take a break and try to get the dog to walk. So now I talked about the, the nuclear triad. Let's get into the United States Empire. I remember reading uh, years ago in an American Legion magazine, I think it was, and uh, I believe the number was 144 bases around the world. So we, we've tried to encircle the Chinese. So we we're certainly trying to encircle Russia with putting nuclear weapons in Ukraine and bringing it into part of NATO, putting basically nuclear weapons right on their border. Same would be but if Russia put nuclear weapons in Mexico or Canada, just wanted to throw that out, a little, little tidbit for the reason for the war in Ukraine. So, uh, of course, they're fighting the Azovs and the Azov Battalion Nazis, uh, denazification. And uh, as Scott Ritter pointed out, you know, once the war is over, we should get a lot of uh, information because uh, there's a lot of evidence of war crimes that the Nazis have done in, uh, in Ukraine. And all that will come out for the world to see, assuming there is a world left. Because uh, I wanted to get into the, the United States. So, the reason that we had... Uh, well, there is no reason for us to have bases all over the world. You know, we should be about protecting the United States. How is a base in, in Kyrgyzstan protect the United States? Oh, well, he puts us closer to Russia so that we can launch on them. I already talked about the bombers, and I talked about the nuclear submarines. A base in Kyrgyzstan doesn't help us with that first strike capability on Russia, other than with our land-based missiles, if we put them there, uh, that's a possibility. I don't know how many of these 144 bases have nuclear weapons. I imagine quite a few do. But, you know, there's a, multiple problems with what's going on in the world today in this new bipolar or multipolar world that is developing. Number one is all those bases, unlike ever before, are vulnerable. We found out how our fleets, our carrier groups, can easily be taken out by these new uh, hypersonic missiles that Russia and China and North Korea uh, have developed. So you want to try to bring in, because that was the, that was the whole point of having these bases, was we always controlled the seas, all right? Nobody could stand against the United States Navy uh, and, you know, live to tell about it. That's not true no more. Those whole fleets could be taken out in a hurry just from one Soviet, I mean, uh, one Russian destroyer armed with a bunch of hypersonic missiles, he could take out four, five, six, seven ships, just one destroyer. You know, imagine a fleet of ships coming from China. I believe uh, even North Korea's got some, some ships. So, so now we see that we don't have command of the seas. Now, what does that mean? How are you going to resupply all these bases? You know, right now the bases, in, uh, well, we just abandoned one base in Syria. By the way, these are all U.S. tax dollars. With George Bush, when we went into Iraq, a lot of people don't know, we spent billions and billions and billions of dollars building bases in Iraq with the airstrips and everything. All that is going to go to waste once Iraq kicks us out. That's all taxpayer money that was pissed away. Same with Afghanistan. Remember the uh, Bagram Air Base that was in Afghanistan and we just abandoned it and left behind $85 billion in military equipment? I mean, do you see where I'm going with this? So if you can't command the seas, how are you going to resupply these 144 bases? And better yet, why in the hell do we have 144 bases? We need to 
take all those troops and bring them back home, we can't afford it no more. We're $34 trillion in debt. So all these troops are vulnerable. But anyway, getting back to Syria, so they did pull out of one base there because they were getting hit. Iraq is getting hit. I haven't heard of any soldiers killed yet, but it's going to happen. I mean, that whole area is flaring up. So I imagine within the next couple months, maybe a year, I... Uh, we're going to have all the bases, we're going to have to pull out of the Middle East completely. And uh, so getting, getting to how warfare has changed. So now that all the countries have all these missiles, you know, Iran, uh, you just saw them hit Pakistan with precision. They hit Syria with precision and they fired from this, like the center of Iran to show the range of those missiles. So they can hit anything in the Middle East that they want to. And they've been working on that feverishly for quite some time developing that technology. And nobody knew how accurate these missiles were that Iran has. That's a game changer. That used to be only the United States that had that capability. Or I shouldn't say only. I mean, Russia's always had it. They just didn't have it to the, the, the numbers and uh, maybe even the precision. But now that's not true. The Russian weapons are even better than the United States. So you see where I'm going with all this. We're no longer clubbing baby seals no more, as Colonel McGregor called it. You know, we bombed the hell out of Li Libya and killed Gaddafi because he was trying to get a, his currency onto a gold standard to get away from the dollar. And then we, uh, we bombed Kosovo. They had no air capabilities, no air defense. Uh, then, you know, we bombed Yemen for years and years uh, through our proxy, Saudi Arabia. Now we're back bombing them again with missiles, except this time they can shoot back. So maybe not, you know, threateningly but at least they've got some missiles that they can fire back I imagine I'd be just a tidbit worried if I was on some of those ships sailing around the Red Sea just a, just a little bit you know especially if we bomb Iran we know Iran's got hypersonic now that those will take out the ships in the Red Sea most definitely so you know how you've always loved McCain when he used to say bomb 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 Iran bomb 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 this has been going on for this, and so it really, really looks like Netanyahu's going to get us into a fight with Iran, and then it's game over for all of our bases in the Middle East. Those soldiers are dead. We can't resupply them. We can't, there's any ships sailing across. I didn't even talk about the submarine capabilities of, of, the, of uh, Russia. Now we know we've got drones underwater. What's the survivability of a fleet trying to resupply troops on a base? In the Middle East, you tell me. I don't think it's very long. So <clears throat> we can see how the U.S. military. I didn't even talk about the woke aspects. How the recruiting is way down. I mean, I wouldn't serve in today's military. I, I always wanted the military to look out for my back. I didn't want to learn about 16,000 genders and uh, and that I have a, a transvestite in the in the crew. Even back even back when I was in the military, it was don't ask, don't tell, which was fine. I didn't care if anybody was gay, just how good they could fight. You know, if they've got my back, you can be a you can be a cat. You know, I heard about the furry, the fur, these kids that are pretending to be furry animals. I mean, I've never heard of such a thing. A whole society is just going crazy. But I wanted to look back in history, give you a couple of stories that I uh, that from from my experience in the federal government. So, the first one was uh, I remember I was working. At this time, uh, it was for Quest Research. I don't think they're, they got bought out, so I can tell you the name of the company. And they stuck me in an office in Crystal City. If you're not familiar with Washington, D.C., Crystal City, uh, the metro goes right there. And it's literally a city, and it, had to, it was really cool because it had all these underground uh, shops and stores. So during the wintertime, you know, you could pretty much get from one end of the Crystal City to the other, much like Toronto. If you've ever been to Toronto, they, you, know, you can travel underground and be nice and warm. It was heated, and uh, plus it was beautiful. Oh my God, uh, the Embassy Suites there. I, I got to stay in that a couple of times, uh, and uh, man, I tell you, I loved the the, the open bar. <laughs> they had you had an hour of free drinks, man. I always took advantage of that. But anyway, getting getting back to the story was I had in my own office. It was really the coolest job ever, and I was developing uh, IR&D. I was working for, for them, independent research and development, or a small business. And every year you put out a, this huge classified document. 
and uh, of course I was writing most of it and uh, what I you know I was going off of material that was provided to me and at that time I was using word perfect you probably never even heard of that and man it you did one little thing and the formatting would just go haywire you know so I had to learn every little nook and cranny about how to use word perfect back then you had to put the, the the formatting stuff in manually it was crazy but anyway so I remember the first time I delivered the document to the guy that was you know the, the, the federal agency that was paying for it and there was this fat guy sitting behind a desk and they led me back to him and I handed him the document I was all proud of it I thought man this is gonna he's gonna be impressed because I mean I put a lot of work into that of course they paid me for it you know and working out of that office it was cool because there was a good looking girl that worked there she just man the desk was just the two of us in there and I uh, you know and it was it was like three or four offices but I was the only one in there and nobody checked on me you know I love it when you can just work and nobody bothers you you know every now and then I might get a visit from from uh, my supervisor that was actually based out of McLean but uh, he would just show up occasionally how you doing and I uh, so anyway I, I handed the guy the document never even opened it he held out his hand and he did like this and he said uh, doesn't weigh enough doesn't weigh enough go back and keep working on it so, it doesn't weigh enough you know I'm you know I'm just saying okay fine and so I you know I went back and I double spaced it <laughs> and tried to add in a bunch of hogwash you know as best I could went back to him still didn't weigh enough I had to go back a third time now the other thing I wanted to get to was classified documents and I uh, because you know we you know Trump got they said, oh, you couldn't take the classified documents out. And then, of course, we found the classified documents in Biden's garage. Let me tell you how, in my experience, classified documents were treated. There were some, organ especially the contract companies, that took the uh, classification very, very seriously. And you had to, you had to sign them in, sign them out. Uh, it, was a, it was a huge process. And then, when you get down into near the uh, Pentagon or whatever, there was never a time that I wasn't, I didn't have a briefcase full of top secret documents going back and forth across Washington, D.C., especially, you know, from Crystal City to McLean or whatever. In fact, it was driving some people crazy because they would go, well, do, we don't see the sign out on these documents. I said, they just gave them to me. What do you mean they just gave them to you? They just, they just told me to bring them up here. I don't know. You do what you want with them, man. I, I don't want them, you know. The other thing I was always worried about was, you know, when, you, when you're when you the courier like that, remember you when you watched that movie, No Way Out? <laughs> I, was, I was always expecting some sort of Chinese or Russian agent to, to, to bushwhack me and steal that briefcase full of classified documents. I couldn't tell you what was in those documents. I never really read them, except for the ones for IR&D because I had to read those to, to put them. And then also what was crazy was I had my own safe. Uh, it was a four, four, four drawer safe, completely full of classified documents. And man, they would come in and they'd inventory that thing and that look for every little piece. And I'm thinking, God dang, what about all them documents I've been carrying back and forth that nobody seems to check in or check out? Yeah, they literally would just hand them to me and say, yes, yeah, just take them. Yeah, we don't want to go check them all out and all that crap, you know. So it depends on where you are in the federal government as to how classified documents get. But let's get back to the story. So even back then, the rot, I'm getting to the rot in the federal government, was really, really bad. So then I got to Cruise Missile Project. I'm on a different contract there. We developed a document routing system. And what was amazing to me was, you know, I, I had, we, you know, we've got our own office, you know. We're working out of our building. I can't remember that Innovative Technologies Group, that was the name of the company. I don't think they're around anymore. But anyway, so, uh, you know, they would say, Kirk, you know, uh, Mike called. And by the way, Mike was on vacation four months out of the year. This is the guy heading up Cruise Missile Project, got four months of vacation a year. So I never knew when he would be there or not, you know. But they'd say, well, Mike's got a problem with his computer. Go over and look at it. Well, you get over there into the Cruise Missile uh, Project building. And, of course, I was working for Nav Air, too. Uh, that's uh, Naval Air. And uh, so... All these people would have their feet propped up on the desk, snoring. Some of them had their face planted on the desk, snoring. Or they would be kicked back reading the newspaper. And that's all you saw. I never saw anybody really working. 
you know, as I went down the hallway. Well, what was expected was me, the contractor, was expected to do all the work. And I, so I'll give you another example of, of, of what I saw. So one time, I, you know, I went in. I can't remember the guy. He was a real prick. And I walked into his office, and I, I was playing with the computer. He was, he was just doing it out of amusement. I didn't realize that at the time. He just wanted to see me struggle to try to fix his computer. So then all of a sudden, he, he says, hold on, let me show you something. And boom, he kicked the crap out of the computer, and it fired right up. <laughs> he goes, see, I know more than you do. You know, he was all proud of that. Like, you know, kicking his computer was, was the way to repair it. I mean, it was the dumbest thing I'd ever seen. But I said, hey, but it worked. What can you say? So that's, uh, that's another one. And then the third story I wanted to get on was uh, the, uh, you know, I put to put in for the document routing system, we were using a database. It was Sybase. It was actually a hell of a good product for way back then. I think this was in the 80s or maybe early 90s. And uh, I mean, it was, it was incredible. I, I installed it. And then of course, you know, so all the documents, uh, you know, if you're going to route them around, you, you got to store them in a central spot, and then they would suck them out of the database, and they would edit the documents. The first time, you know, now we just send it through an email or, you know, other routing systems or just put it out on a, on a shared drive, you know, but that shouldn't exist back then. So we came up with this novel way. We were using DeskView, not Windows 3.1, by the way. Uh, DeskView was a great product. It's unfortunate that for some reason everybody wanted Windows, which was a terrible product. I, I don't understand that. But, uh... So anyway, about, I don't know, the system had been up and running two or three months, and I get a phone call from, from Mike, the guy who was on vacation four months out of the year. He says, man, you know, the document routing system's going real slow. Can you come over here and try to figure out what's going on? I said, well, yeah, sure. You know, so I, I went down there and I went into the server room, and you, know, you could just see the disks spinning, spinning like crazy. And so I went back to Mike, I said, Mike, yeah, I said, who's maintaining the database? I said, because you're getting an unusual amount of uh, disk activity. You know, if they, you know, you have to reorg that thing from time to time. He says, well, we don't have anybody that can do that. I said, what do you mean? I, you know, because when I installed everything, I assumed that they were going to take it over. That I didn't have to maintain it. I was the one writing all the software for the system. They said, no, 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 we, we figured you were maintaining it. I said, no, I ain't done crap. So that night, you know, I went down, I reorg the database, solved the problem. But that tells you how little the federal government works. I just wanted to tell these three stories. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? So that's what the federal government looked like back then. You can run on for a long time. Run on for a long time. Run on for a long time. Sooner or later, God's gonna cut you down. Sooner or later, God's gonna cut you down. Go tell that globalist liar, that Democrat idiot writer, that rhino rambler, that nuclear war gambler, that backbiting U.S. politician. Sooner or later, God's gonna cut you down. Sooner or later, God's gonna... Cut you down.